third graders. Welcome back to your TV classroom. Today is Tuesday, February 9th. <sighs> I hope you had a great Monday. I did. Before we get going, let's check in with our zone. Let's see, Rafa, hmm, well, my brain is really focused today. My body's feeling calm and my emotions are feeling content. So I'm in the green zone. Mr. Kevin, what zone are you in today? I'm in the green zone too. And it's really great. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know why you're in the green zone, Mr. Kevin? because I had a good night's sleep. Oh, you know, I did as well. I told Mr. Wally last night, I said, I am really not been getting good night's sleep because I've been waking up with Oliver. Can you please wake up with Oliver tonight? And he did, and I slept all night. And man, I tell you what, when you get good sleep, it really helps your brain. Makes all the difference. It really does. Friends, what, what zone are you at today? How are you feeling? Make sure if there's someone around you or you have your learning buddy that you share with them. Now, before we get going, we're gonna be doing a True or False Tuesday, which I'm so excited about. But before we do that, you're going to need your whiteboard and a marker today and an eraser and your learning buddy. So as we're doing True or False Tuesday, if you need to go gather that, go grab it really quick. So let's do our first question. Matthew is inviting three of his friends over to play games with him. If each player will eat four sandwiches, how many does Matthew need to make? So they're saying that Matthew needs to make 16 sandwiches so all four friends can eat. Is this true or false? Hmm. It is. Now, right before we started filming, I asked Miss Oslin to read this um, story problem and solve it and see if she was having the same thinking I was thinking around it. And the reason I asked her is because I said, you know, some students might think it's false. They might think it's 12 sandwiches. And Miss Oslin said, Matthew, don't forget to count yourself. And that's a really good thing to remember, that when we're talking about a group, if the person or the main character in that story problem is going to be part of that group, you need to make sure to add them into the total. So it would be his three friends and Matthew makes four people eating sandwiches. So four times four is 16, 16 sandwiches. Let's do another one. Matthew also made cookies for him and his three friends. If he makes a dozen cookies, how many cookies will each boy get? Ooh. Hmm. So we know that there are four friends, right? Hmm. What's a dozen? How many cookies is a dozen? Well, a dozen is 12. So how can we figure this out? There's 12 friends, or 12 cookies. There's four people. So how many cookies will each person get? Three. Each person will get three cookies. So is this true or false? It's false. Okay. Three times 50 equals 125. True or false? Hmm. I know automatically it's false because when I have groups of 50, I know my answer is going to end in a zero. It's either gonna be 50 or 100, or 150 or 200, or 250 or 300. True or false? Three groups of 100 is 300. True or false? What they did here, what someone did here is they did, well, I know three times 100 is 300, and then there's 50, and they just said 350. Is that how that works? Is that how we do distributive property? No, we do three times 100 
It's a really common mistake though, if kids are going fast and not slowing down and really thinking, it's a really common mistake to make. So let's see what our answer would be. Three groups of 100 is 300, plus three groups of 50, which is 150. So that equals 450, whoops. They missed a whole 100. Okay, now you should have your whiteboard and everything ready to go. Today we're learning to write and solve one-step word problems that include multiplication and division. We just practiced a little bit of that. Let's get into the learning. On your whiteboard, please write a multiplica multiplication equation to represent this array. Go ahead, write it down. I'm gonna give you just like 30 seconds. Groups of eight equals, what is it? What's three times eight? Well, what's two times eight? 16 plus eight is 24. That's how I have to do multiplication equations in my brain. My brain is one of those brains that doesn't like to memorize math facts. Because to me and my brain, without a story to align to it, it doesn't really have a place to live in my brain, which can be really hard. But I've learned strategies like two times eight is 16 and eight more is 24, and I can still do my facts within about three seconds. So that's why we teach you those things. Great, we did it. Now here's the fun part. Today, we're gonna tell some stories that will match some arrays. You can write it down or you can just think it, that's up to you. It says write or, I'm gonna say or think of a word problem about this array that you could solve with multiplication or division and then write an equation to represent your problem. So they've given us the model we're gonna come up with a problem and write the equation. So I'm gonna give you about two minutes to look at this, to think, to get some things down on your whiteboard for a problem, and I'm gonna do the same. You can choose multiplication or division. Are you ready? Go ahead and do that, you have two minutes. down. It's up to you. Rafa and Pebble, are you thinking of your, your story? Because you're going to get to share. Okay, friends, I'm gonna share mine, and then you can share yours when I'm done with your learning buddy, and then maybe Rafa or Pebble or Mr. Kevin might have one to share too. And we'll see how they're similar, how are the stories similar in what we did, and how are they different? Okay, 
Let's take a look at mine on my whiteboard. It says, ooh, there we go. Ooh, I have to go the opposite direction, friends. Oh, have you ever tried to do something in a mirror and you go one way and you think you have to go one way but you have to go the other way? That's what it's like here at the TV classroom. So sometimes on Monday, I'm not used to it. I said there are 40 baseballs and five players at practice. How many baseballs will each player get? And I represented my story with this equation. 40 divided by five equals blank. And the answer is eight baseballs each. So I made a division problem. I took the whole, I divided it into groups, and I was figuring out how many I was gonna need in each group. Okay, now I want you to share your problem with someone next, next to you or with your learning buddy and explain your thinking. I'm going to give you 45 seconds to a minute. Ready? Go. Okay, friends, Mr. Kevin, could we get the PowerPoint up? Did you think of a problem, Mr. Kevin? We'll see if he did, friends. I'm sorry, I did not. Oh, that's okay, Mr. Kevin. You know, back there behind the booth, friends, Mr. Kevin has a lot of things he has to do. So sometimes he can and sometimes he can't. So let's see, Pebble, what problem did you think of? Oh. Oh, that's a great one. I wonder if you at home could write down the equation that matches Pebble's problem. Are you ready? Here it is. There were eight kids on a playground. Each of them hit five baseballs. How many baseballs did they hit? So Pebble, it's kind of like you took the array and flipped it the other direction. So there's eight kids, so here's our eight kids, and each of them have five baseballs. So what equation would it be, friends? Eight groups of five, and that's gonna equal 40 baseballs. Now, in my problem, the answer was eight baseballs. But in this problem, the answer was 40 baseballs. How are our problems similar? And how are our problems different? Private think time. Hmm. Well, Rafa, let's see. In Pebbles, Pebble had eight groups of five, and that was a total of 40 baseballs. But in mine, I had five groups of Eight. My answer was eight baseballs, but I started with 40 baseballs. So we both had 40 baseballs. I had five groups. Pebble had eight groups, but then I had eight baseballs and Pebble had five baseballs. Interesting. So they're similar, but they're different. Yes, Mr. Kevin? It's like you started with the sum and Pebble started with a part. Right, so like I started with the whole, which in multiplication we would call the product. I started with like the whole group, right? I took the whole amount and then I split it up. But Pebble, he had the groups and the number in each group, the two kind of parts we work with, to find out the total amount. What does that remind you of? It's kind of like addition. We have two parts and it makes a whole. And we subtract, we have a whole, and we take away one part to find the other part. In multiplication and division, we have a group and a number of each groups to find out the total. And in division, we take the total and we divide it into groups or number in each group to find out the other. So they're very similar. Isn't that cool? All right, let's go to the next problem. I'm 
gonna skip this one. No, we're gonna do, we're not gonna read the big thing at the top. We're just gonna read the problems. It says, two bunches have a total of 12 bananas. Each banana has this, each bunch, excuse me, has the same number of bananas. How many bananas are in each bunch? So we have 12 bananas, and we're gonna divide it into a number in a group. So what can we divide? How many can we have in a bunch? What do you think, Mr. Kevin? What could we do where each one has the same amount and we're gonna have a total of 12? Well, hmm. hmm. Well, I could do one, but I don't think one is a bunch. A bunch is like more than two, because two would be a pair. Right. Hmm. Well, could we do three? I think so. If we have 12 bananas and we have three in each bunch, friends, how many banana, how many bunches of banana are we gonna have? Three, six, nine. We're gonna have four bunches of bananas. Or what if we did 12 bananas and we did six bananas in each bunch? How many bunches would we have? Two, we'd have two bunches of bananas. Down below it says each bunch has six bananas. If there are 12 bananas, how many bunches are there? We just figured that out. How many are there? Two bunches. And we were using groups and how many in each group and the total of 12 to help us figure out the division. So if you know your multiplication, guess what friends? You know your division. Just like when you know your addition, you also know your subtraction. It's the same idea, the same concept. I've got groups, a number of each group, and it makes a total. I've got a total. I am dividing into groups to figure out how many in each group, or I'm dividing into how many in each group to figure out how many groups I have. So cool. So, if I was to say I have, I'm gonna do this in white so you can see it, if I was to say I have six bananas, whoop, that's the, mm, Mrs. Wally, no, no, no. Try again. I have two bunches of six bananas, and that gives me 12 bananas. Or I say I have 12 bananas with six bananas in each bunch, and I have two bunches. How are those two alike? What are you noticing? Oh, Rafa, yes. Friends, I'm gonna do green. I think green showed up on this really well. Look, my product, and my total amount, my number of groups, my number of groups, my number in each group, my number in each group. It's just like the adding and subtracting with a number bond. But we're not taking two parts and squishing them together to make a whole. We're taking two parts and we're skip counting to find a total amount, which is our product. And then we're taking our product and we're dividing it into equal groups or into groups and counting how many in each group to find our answer. They're so closely related. So today, you are going to be doing your assignment on page 361 and 362. You're gonna be doing an equation and then practicing writing and telling and solving story problems. Now, today we learned to write or tell and solve one-step word problems that included multiplication and division. We were understanding the situation. We didn't create the model for today. We will tomorrow. We looked at a model, right? Then we used equations to solve the problem and we were able to answer. And we were using the units, bunches, baseballs, just like when we were doing square inches. We were making sure to assign that unit to our answer. Now, 
Mr. Kevin, if they come up with a really amazing story problem that they want to share with the TV classroom, tell them how they can get it to us. Of course, you can share your word problem with us by emailing it to TV classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us or you can mail it uh, to TV classroom 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Thank you so much, Mr. Kevin. Now, friends, up next is your break and then learning with Miss Oslin. You're going to need your learning buddy, your ELA packet, your pencil, and be ready to learn with her. You're going to have a break. Take care of your needs. You did an awesome job today. Thank you for learning with me and thinking, and I hope that you have a great rest of your Tuesday. See you tomorrow, third graders. Bye. Rules. One, you have 10 seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get 10 points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Five, see how many points you can get. Good luck.
my third graders, welcome back from your break. Excellent job gathering your materials and being ready to go. Go ahead and take your ELA packet and your pencil and put it off to the side. You don't yet need that, but feel free to keep your learning buddy in your lap if that is going to help you focus. Let's remind ourselves of our three personal standards. Say these out loud with me. Show respect. Show respect. Make good decisions. Make good decisions. Solve problems. Solve problems. And I have to point out, Mr. Kevin just made a good decision before we started. He got his water, he got his cup of coffee, so he is ready to go. He thought about what he might need and he took care of it before we started so he didn't have to walk away. It's so nice to be back in third grade. Yeah, welcome back to third grade. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have been learning about fiction. There's different types of fiction. And today we're going to learn that readers of fiction, that's you and I, closely follow the details about the main character or characters as the story unfolds. So we're going to pay close attention to details about our characters as our story is told or as our story unfolds. Now, on the first day of our fiction unit, we read a fable by Arno Lobel titled The Crocodile in the Bedroom. And you may remember that a fable is a short story used to teach a moral or a lesson, often with two or three animals as characters. The characters in fiction stories often face challenges and overcome obstacles. And as a result, they learn a lesson. And as readers, we learn the lesson as well with our characters. And the characters are different, just like people, and they each have different personalities, character traits, and different things that they add to the story. In some stories, especially in fables, like we're going to read today, the characters are animals who act like humans or have the qualities or characteristics that you and I also could have. So in your ELA packet, we're going to use the list sample of character traits it's page 23 in your ELA packet. And we're going to read a fable today and think about how would we describe our characters based on the details that the author gives us. This is the book Fables by Arnold Lobel. And the fable that we're going to read today is called The Bear and the Crow. And as I read this fable, I'm going to think about which character trait from our list best describes the main character, which is the bear? And then, on page 15, identifying characters, traits, and in fables, I'm going to think about the detailed descriptions, how our character looks. I'm going to think about what do they do? What are their actions? What do they say, the dialogue? And the thoughts, what do they think and feel? And all of those details are going to give me a hint for what word, what character trait I could use to describe my character, the bear. So the details we're gonna think about are the descriptions, what do they look like? The actions, what do they do? The dialogue, what do they say? And their thoughts, what do they think and feel? Are you ready? The Bear and the Crow. The bear was on his way to town. He was dressed in his finest coat and vest. He was wearing his best derby hat and his shiniest shoes. How grand I look, said the bear to himself. The townsfolk will be impressed. My clothes are at the height of fashion. That means that they're uh, really fashionable and they're what people are wearing at that time. My clothes are at the height of fashion. Forgive me for listening, said a crow who was sitting on the branch of a tree, but I must disagree. Your clothes are not at the height of fashion. I have just flown in from town. I can tell you exactly how the gentlemen are dressed there. Do tell me, cried the bear. I am so eager to wear the most proper attire. This year, said the crow, the gentlemen are not wearing hats. They all have frying pans on their heads. They are not wearing coats and vests. They are covering themselves with bedsheets. 
They are not wearing shoes. They are putting paper bags on their feet. Oh dear, cried the bear. My clothes are completely wrong. The bear hurried home. He took off his coat and vest and hat and shoes. He put a frying pan on his head. He wrapped himself in a bed sheet. He stuffed his feet into large paper bags and rushed off toward the town. When the bear arrived on Main Street, the people giggled and smirked and pointed their fingers. What a ridiculous bear, they said. The embarrassed bear turned around and ran home. On the way, he met the crow again. Crow, you did not tell me the truth, cried the bear. I told you many things, said the crow, as he flew out of the tree, but never once did I tell you that I was telling the truth. Even though the crow was high in the sky, bear could still hear the shrill sound of his cackling laughter. And then the moral, as we learn in fables, we're learning a lesson along with our characters, is when the need is strong, there are those who will believe anything. Mm -hmm. What a clever story and what a great lesson to learn. I'm thinking about these two very, very different characters, the bear and the crow. And I want to look at the character traits list and see if I can find a good word to describe the bear. So you look at your list and I'll look at my list and let's see what we come up with. How would you describe the bear? Hmm. The bear was trying to impress. Hmm. Oh, the bear was not very confident in his clothing or in what he thought would be fashionable clothing. I think the word to best describe bear is insecure. Say insecure. Insecure. Insecure means not confident. Like you don't believe in what you're thinking or saying. And often characters who are, in, are insecure will say and do anything to impress the other characters or people. It sounds a lot like bear. So let's use our chart to prove our theory. So Mr. Kevin, I have my chart down here on the table ready to show. And I started with my name and today's date, the title of the fable, which is The Bear and the Crow. And I have the author, Arnold Lobel. And the character that I'm gonna think about is the bear. And the word, the character trait that I think best describes the bear is insecure. So let's think. What details did our author give us about how the bear looks that made me think that bear was insecure. Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Rafa, I'm thinking about how the bear put on really fancy clothes. He put on a vest and a derby hat and shiny shoes. That's really detailed descriptions about how they looked that let me think that the bear is insecure because he put those on to impress other people. So in this circle where it says detailed descriptions, how they look, I'm gonna say the descriptions of the clothing. So he was wearing a derby hat, shiny shoes, fancy vest, because he was trying to impress the people in town. Now, if I'm thinking that Bear is insecure, not confident, what did they do? What did Bear do to show me 
that he was not confident. Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what Bear did that makes us think that Bear was insecure. Rafa, he listened to the crow. If he was confident, if he was secure, he wouldn't have listened to the crow and he wouldn't have gone and changed his clothes. So I think that's two actions. He listened to the crow and he changed his clothes. Now, in this circle where it says actions, what they do, this is where I'm gonna write those two things that Bear did that showed me that he is insecure. The next circle is dialogue. What did Bear say that made me think that he was insecure? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Rafa, he said that he wanted to impress the town, townspeople, that he wanted to wear the clothes were at the height of fashion. Mr. Kevin? It's also the way he, he talked to the crow. He said, please tell me, crow. Oh, he did. He was almost begging the crow for the information. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I want to include that. Thank you. What did he say? Please tell me how they're dressing. Right now, the last detail that we're going to think about is the thoughts of Bear. What did Bear think and feel that makes us think that Bear is insecure or not confident? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Rafa, the thoughts that Bear had was he planned his outfit around wanting it to impress the townspeople, and he talked about how he felt embarrassed when he went into town and they were laughing at him. Almost as if he couldn't bear the ridicule. Oh, Mr. Kevin, I see what you did there. He couldn't bear it. He was embarrassed. <laughs> now, as readers of fiction, we pay really close attention to the details in what our characters look like, what they do, what they say, and what they think or feel to figure out what is a character trait? What are their qualities? And we just did that with Bear. Now we're gonna read another fable together. And your job is character two, name and trait at the bottom of your graphic organizer. You are going to complete this thinking about one of the characters in the fable that we're going to read or you can complete the bottom half on thinking about a character in one of your independent reading books. It's up to you. Now, let's read our new fable, The Pelican and the Crane. Now, I am noticing that both of the fables that we've read today do have two characters who are animals. Remember, that's a feature of fables. 
the pelican and the crane. The crane invited the pelican to tea. So nice of you to ask me to come, said the pelican to the crane. No one invites me anywhere. Entirely my pleasure, said the crane to the pelican, passing him the sugar bowl. Do you take sugar in your tea? Yes, thank you, said the pelican. He dumped half the sugar into his cup while spilling the other half on the floor. I seem to have no friends at all, said the pelican. Do you take milk in your tea? asked the crane. Yes, thank you, said the pelican. He poured some of the milk into his cup, but most of it made a puddle on the table. I wait and wait, said the pelican. Nobody ever calls me. Will you have a cookie? asked the crane. Yes, thank you, said the pelican. He took a large pile of cookies and stuffed them into his mouth. His shirt front was covered with crumbs. I hope you will invite me again, said the pelican. Perhaps, said the crane, but I am so very busy these days. Goodbye until the next time, said the pelican. He swallowed many more cookies. He wiped his mouth with the tablecloth and left. After the pelican had gone, the crane shook his head and sighed. He called for his maid to clean up the mess. Now, the moral or the lesson that we are meant to learn from this fable, when one is a social failure, the reasons are as clear as day. That means when one does not have many friends, it's usually pretty obvious why. Now, you as a reader are going to think about what did our characters look like? What did they do? What did they say? And how did they think or what did they feel? And you're gonna decide how you would describe them as characters. What traits would you use using your sample character traits list? And then you're going to write about it in this graphic organizer. And again, this is your independent work today. You're also going to think about the details in your independent reading texts. What does the author do to let you know more about the characters, whether it's a fable or not? You can still think about what your characters look like, what they do, what they say, and how they think or feel to decide their character traits. Because today we're learning that readers of fiction closely follow the details about the main characters as the story unfolds or as the story is told. Make sure you're also adding to your reading log. You can also write an entry in your reading notebook as you're documenting your deeper understanding of the characters in your stories. And if you are able to and want to send us what you're thinking, a response to your reading or your graphic organizer, Mr. Kevin is gonna tell you how to do that. Absolutely, if you're able to tell us about your fable, please email tvclassroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. You can also send it in the regular mail to TV Classroom at 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Now, third graders, this is our time for your affirmation. This is where we lift ourselves up and say positive things about ourselves before we go off to tackle this new learning uh, thinking about our character traits in fables. You are a strong reader and writer, and I want you to remind yourself of that. So say it out loud with me. I am a strong reader and writer. Excellent job today, third graders. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.